Good morning. Welcome everyone here this morning. It's really good to see all your red faces this morning because that means we're all in it together. I'm assuming there's a lot of creaking muscles and squeaky joints this morning too. And Juan Miller that was here yesterday, let's remember him in prayer, him and his daughter there. Not sure. He just asked for prayer. So let's pray for them. Are there any other announcements? No school devotions this week, so. All right. Doth he meditate? That's the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly and doesn't, um, yeah. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And he, the one that does that, shall be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth continually forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall always be green and not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly, or the ones that uh, do walk in the way of sinners and stand with the ungodly and sit with the scornful, um, those are that their tree doesn't have roots and their leaf is not green and they are just like chaff. They're like the dead straw that comes out of the combine after they um, cut the wheat. So they're, they're just dead grass. Um, they're like chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, that goes along with uh, in, in John 15 where it talks about the vine and we're attached to the vine. That when, when someone's attached to the vine, they're a living green and they're, they, they have, there's fruit and there's life. But if you put a, a, a wheat straw you know, with no head on it and no root, just a, the, the hollow yellow wheat straw, and you stick that into a into a tree trunk, it doesn't matter how much sap is coming up in there, that straw is not going to, that's not going to bring forth any fruit. It's dead. And I don't know, how do we walk in the way of the ungodly, in the counsel of the ungodly, or the way of sinners? I don't know, just, a, just one thing. In our, in our life, we, are, we have access to so much information and so much, yeah, so much that it takes discernment and discipline to know what, yeah, to know what we, we feed on. Sometimes we have a hankering for certain things and that um, desire is fed by what we what we enjoy and what we read and what we absorb and what we listen to and what we watch and what we do and what we imagine and all of that. And all of those desires and information intake and all of that is has to do with the counsel, the information, the what we're receiving. And is it is that our form of walking in the way of the ungodly? Or do we have our delight in the law of the Lord? It will, have a, it will have an effect on what our leaf is like, what our roots are like, and how healthy we are as a tree for God. So I'll just leave it with that for now. Dwight, if you want to come forward, we'll all stand, and we'll have prayer for the message here. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you that you have given us direction on how to live. We thank you that you have raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places so that we can have eternal life with you. Lord, would you help us this week to be disciplined in, our, in what counsel we get and the way we walk and how we live and what information we receive and take in. Help us to be strong and fruitful for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother.
Good morning to each of you. Greetings in the name of Jesus. It's been good to be here today, and I too enjoyed much our time of fellowship and activity yesterday. Thank you, brother. And uh, also have can uh, associate to some of those creaky joints and achy muscles this morning, and tomorrow is probably going to be worse. But it was a good day of being together as a church family and learning to know new new people, and and it was a it was a it was a wonderful day. And I also want to give special thanks to each one of our church family that made this possible. There was a lot of work that went into that, so thank you for that. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 13. I was sitting here in church a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I don't know if the Lord laid it on my heart as a need that I have or why, but I wrote down two words, and I've kind of been thinking about them ever since, and I just was not able to come up with a very, a very, um, a very catchy title or, or a title that, that makes, made me feel very good. So I come up with just what it was. And the title is, Am I Selfish? And I'm not going to take a raised hand here this morning. I'm not going to do a poll. I'm not going to ask you to your face if you're selfish. It's a question that I want to ask myself. And as I studied this, I realized why preachers may not always, don't very often preach on this, because it is a, is a, it's a pretty, um, it's a subject that can get pretty close to your heart. Am I selfish? So the definition of selfish is concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself. Seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being, well-being without regard for others. That is a dictionary definition of selfish. Read it again. Concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regard for others. There was a apparently well-known prime minister of the United Kingdom's had this thought, selfishness is the greatest curse of the human race. Another study that was conducted several years ago on the principle of the golden rule, and in this study, the participants were asked to make a list of ten people that they knew very well. And once that list was completed, they were to they were asked to label each person as happy or not happy. The final step was for the participants to go through that list again and label each individual as selfish or unselfish. And the results of the study showed that the happiest people were always the unselfish people, those who put the others ahead of themselves. So we live in a world that is not very happy. If you was to go out into the world today, maybe New York City, Baltimore, I'm not sure where the shooting was yesterday, but there's a lot of really sad things in this world. A lot of very unhappy people. It's been said <clears throat> that the core of selfishness is self-idolatry. When someone behaves in a selfish manner, they are numb to the pain that they cause others. It goes on to say that there are many selfish people because it is extremely easy to be selfish. It takes no self-control to be selfish. It is a natural tendency that I have this morning as I stand before you it is a natural tendency to be selfish. This article or this, this reading went on to say that as we study selfishness, it is more clear, it becomes more and more clear that it is a character trait or it is actually a sin. Selfishness is sin because at the heart of selfishness is an absence of love for others. And Brother Willie mentioned that in our Sunday school class this morning. <clears throat> With selfishness comes a sense of entitlement, and each one of us here today are born depraved sinners, are entitled to nothing except the wrath of God 
All we have and are is because of God's mercy and grace. So that's what I want to start out with this morning. Let's look at this story of Abram and Lot in Genesis chapter 13. We're going to read this, uh, we're going to read from Genesis 13, 1 through 13. And Abram went up out of Egypt, and he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also went, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelleth then in the land." dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. So a few things you want to look at here in this story this morning. We have Uncle Abram and we have Nephew Lot and they have come up out of Egypt and they are a blessed group of people. They got a pile of money and they got a pile of animals and they got a lot of stuff. They got everything, you could say. The Lord had blessed them very, very much. It says they were rich in cattle and silver and gold. All was well. Very soon they realized that the land they had was not enough to sustain what they had. There was not enough food and not enough water. It said the land could not bear them. So what do we do? And as if we was to put this into a, a business meeting in, in, our, in this century, you know, we would, we would meet together and we would discuss what to do. And we would talk about different ideas and try to come to a conclusion of what to do with these two booming businesses. <clears throat> but it says that there was strife. It says those that, those that were in charge of the, of the water, in charge of, the, of the, the pasture or whatever, it says there was strife between them because there just simply wasn't enough. So these two businesses, man, they had to make a decision. Abram said, let there be no strife between me and thee and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. And then he said these three words. He said, we be brethren. So that was kind of his basis of this. Abram goes on and makes an offer of a lifetime to Lot. He said, look around. He said, see all this. He said, whatever you want, take it. Take your pick. You know, a lot of times we build a pretty good case against Lot, don't we? But what would you and I have done in that situation? We had an offer to go to a place that was established, probably had wells, probably had grass, you know, two feet tall, lush, thick, whatever. Um, Abram said, go. Take your pick. You go one way, I'll go the other. Let there be no strife. We be brethren. It goes on to say that Lot lifted up his eyes and he's seen all that that beauty out there, the well-watered plain of Jordan. And we know, we know the story well. We know what happened. The sad ending of Lot's family. So looking back over this story, as, you, as, you, as we read it and as you thought about it, maybe tried to, to put yourself in the context of the story. What could have been different? What could have happened 
that would have made this a success story and not a story that ended in fire and brimstone. What, what could have been done different? Let's continue reading here in chapter 13. Let's pick up in 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham, to Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, lift up th now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. <clears throat> Lot lifted up his eyes and saw what he wanted to see. The Lord said unto Abram, Lift up now thine eyes, and look what I will give thee. Sodom and Gomorrah was a city full of selfish people. Let's flip on back here a couple of chapters to chapter 19. <clears throat> Pick up in verse 24. <clears throat> Lot lifted up his eyes. 19 and 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plains and all the inhabitants of the city that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as a smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the city of the plain, the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in, the, in the which Lot dwelt. Selfishness is the greatest curse of the human race. Selfishness is the garden where many sins are grown. We're going to jump around here a little bit. I trust you can bear with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Second Timothy three and verse one. <clears throat> this know. <clears throat> this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. <clears throat> so how can we as Christians in this county, in this building, or from whatever church you represent here this morning, how can we be a people that live above the grip of selfishness? Live above the natural tendency to be more concerned about me than someone else. More concerned about my pleasure, my well-being than someone else. How can we do that? Why did God make me a selfish person by nature? <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2. <clears throat> I'd have to have Jason finish this message for me if I, my voice gives out. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse number 1. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, 
But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> I would like to break in here in the last <clears throat> verses of this, of this reading here. And I would look a little bit at Jesus and his life and his testimony. <clears throat> the one who lived on this earth as a man. The one who lived on this earth and had temptations and natural tendencies to be selfish. Yet was victorious. Verse 7, made of himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, it says, He, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> Verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted and given a name above every name. The greatest example of a selfless life we could ever read about this morning was the life of of Jesus as he lived on this earth. And the greatest reward ever given for a selfless life was a name above every name. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Yes, as a Christian here this morning, we are called to a high standard when it comes to a selfless life. There is no room for a selfish heart in the child of God. Back to a few more verses here in Philippians. Verse 1. If there be any consolation in Christ, or if there be any comfort of love, or if there be any fellowship of the Spirit, or any mercies, or if we're going to be full of joy, we need to be like-minded we need to be having the same love, be of one accord, of one mind. And it goes on to tell us how we can do this in verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Friends, this morning I don't have to tell you how hard it is to be a person that is in lowliness of mind. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of, other, of others. Strife and vainglory speaks of contention and self-conceit. <clears throat> Let nothing be done through contention or self-conceit. Lowliness of mind is simply humility. Humility of mind, humility of heart, humility of actions. Let each esteem other better than themselves. And it goes on to say that to look not every man on his own things. Don't be worried about just what's going on in your life. <clears throat> Don't be worried about just how bad I have it. Think about others. Think about others. A key way we can esteem others better than ourselves is by looking also on the things of others, taking an interest in other people's lives. You know, it takes time to be unselfish. It takes time to esteem others better than ourselves. It takes time to look also on the things of others. This morning, it takes time to be a husband and a father. It takes time to be a wife and a mother. It takes time to be a teacher, to be a fellow brother or a sister in the church. It takes time to be on the food committee, the school board, the trustees. It takes time to be a neighbor. It takes time to be a friend. 
Am I selfish with my time? What do I do with the hours that God has given me each and every day? The average 70-year-old has spent 24 years sleeping, 14 years working, 8 years in amusements, 6 years at the dinner table, 5 years in transportation, 4 years talking, 3 years in education, 2 years in study and reading, and the other 4 years were in miscellaneous things. Of those four years, the average person spent 45 minutes in church on Sundays and devoted five minutes to prayer each day. This adds up to a total of five months he gave to God over 70 years of life. If he would have attended Sunday school and three one-hour services a week, he would have spent one year and nine months in church in a 70-year span. This was statistics taken from a book called Faithful in All Things, written by Barbara Bean. But I find it fascinating as you break down your life and the minutes that God has given you, am I selfish with the, with the moments I have? It's one of the reasons that we struggle with being selfish so much is because we simply don't have time to be unselfish. Let's turn to James chapter 4. I just want to read that. Just one verse here. James chapter 4 and verse 14. Where is ye know not what shall be on the morrow? And then we have this question. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Am I selfish? Is there a way I can conquer this and be the person who has the mind of Christ? And as I, as I wrestle with that this morning, and as I tried to come up with an answer that I could get personally or that I could share, what is the key? How can we be a selfless church full of selfless members, a selfless youth group? I simply come up with is we need to have a proper view of God. And we need to have a proper view of ourselves. Psalm 8. I want to read this slowly. I want you to take this in. Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens the work of thy fingers, the moon, and the stars which thou hast ordained. Verse 4, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field. The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea. And whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name. In all the earth. <clears throat> May the words of this psalm reach into your hearts this morning, and may we find ourselves as selfless servants of an Almighty God. 
a God that made us, that made you and that made I, me a little lower than the angels. A God that gave us dominion over His creation. All sheep, all oxen, all the beast, all the fowl, all the fish. Do I have a proper view of God this morning? O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Turn on your church hymnals to 441. This is my heart's desire this morning. I would like to say that this is my testimony. But God knows my heart. It is so hard to walk in lowly paths of service free. We stand together. Um, let's see your dust. You got a pitch? No. Let's be encouraged. The battle is real. The struggle is there. But we serve a God who knows and who dealt with our tendencies. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, song leader, I guess. Science praises number 805. Let's stand for this song as well.
Am I selfish? That was the question that was asked this morning for each one of us. And I'm, yeah. What are your thoughts this morning or testimony that you would have to share? Thank you. That's right.
but I can, can be totally busy and still be selfish. I don't know, it, it's kind of one of those hard things um, in our own I, I think in, in my own life, I have to really question my motives for doing something. I mean, in business, I think so. I think so. Thank you for that. Bless you. Thank you for that. Yeah, that kind of a jarring question, am I selfish, as a title there. Well, we would all say, yes, we are selfish. I mean, we have those tendencies. And then we would also probably all say that we're not totally selfish because we could point to certain things where we are, have been unselfish. But probably a better judge of our selfishness or lack of it would be in those that are close to us. Our family members could tell us probably better than us. Um, they're probably a better thermometer for us than we are. And the other thing is, the other question that stood out is, am I too selfish? Or am I selfish because I'm too busy to be unselfish with my time? Um, I'm not quite sure how to put this into words, but some days we have this schedule that is packed full and we have a focus on getting, we, we have to, we have multiple deadlines to meet 
it feels like, and we have to meet these deadlines, and we're focused on, the, on it, how do we, <laughs> and sometimes we have interruptions that come, and we just don't have time to deal with the interruptions. And what do we do? I don't know. Some interruptions can, can wait, some can't. I don't know. That's just a, a quandary I don't have an answer for. Maybe you do, and I'd love to hear your answer if you do have one. So. But am I, too, am I selfish because I'm too busy to be unselfish with my time? Am I selfish because I'm too stingy to be unselfish with, with our money that God has entrusted us with? Am I selfish because um, I'm too proud to give up myself, my, my own wishes for somebody else's? Thank you for that message. That was, a, that was a very timely message this morning. Is there anyone else yet? Praise God. Praise God. Sister Anita has been miraculously healed, and it is, it is humbling, humbling. It's very humbling to see God's work, God work there. Praise God. Let's stand for prayer. And uh, Brent Strite, would you uh, close, dismiss us and also ask the blessing on the food? Missed.